tell me, man, that this video on the TV has to be done. Oh, it's a fuck that. I don't know when, but. Good morning. It's a joy to gather together as the people of God. Welcome to our time of worship this morning at Paradise Holschwang. Just a few announcements as we begin the service. Uh, first of all, next Sunday is a communion Sunday, and we will uh, be having the, the communion elements in the back as we have been before. Uh, also, uh, we are not going to be having an in-person Ash Wednesday service this year, uh, but there will be noontime uh, Zoom devotionals on uh, the Wednesdays throughout the Lenten season. So whether you want to uh, connect on Zoom with a computer or a smartphone, or even you can call in with that, there's a, uh, there's a phone number there. It is a long distance call, but you can call in and join that way. And I'd invite you to join for that. And uh, a recording of that will be available with a reflection for Ash Wednesday uh, after the fact on Facebook, too, if you want to see that. Other than that, uh, I did just want to share that uh, as the consistory, we are looking at you know, when we will be gathering back together uh, without masks. And uh, I'll be writing more about that coming out soon. But in short, you know, the hope is that as vaccines are becoming more available that people can get signed up for that and that once everybody has the opportunity to become vaccinated of those who want to do that and, and I would encourage you to do so, uh, you know, that we might be able to then gather together and resume the normal life of the church, not just uh, worshiping without masks on, but things like Sunday school, luncheons, our prayer breakfast, and other activities such as that. So that's something that's coming on the horizon, and I just want to encourage you uh, to contact your doctor if you haven't, if you're eligible, and, uh, and uh, I look forward to being able to get back to the normal life of the church, not just... Uh, with the, the regular things that we do, but with lots of feasting, luncheons, and ice cream socials. I think we have a lot to make up that we've missed in this last year, so we'll have to cram that into a few months so we can get back on track. Are there any other announcements this morning? And let's prepare our hearts to worship as we listen to the prelude.
Please now join in our invocation hymn, Open My Eyes That I May See, number 480, verse 2. Thank you that you have welcomed us into your presence. We know that as we meet you here, we meet your love. Fill our place, fill our hearts with an overwhelming sense of your love this morning. And grant that we may reflect that love to one another and back to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to join me now in our call to worship, which is taken from Psalm 40. Please respond in the bolded print. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me up on a slimy bed, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Amen. I invite you to join with me in our opening hymn, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee, number 589. <laughs> It is the desire of our heart, friends, that we would walk faithfully with our Master, with our Lord. And yet we know at times we have chosen a different path. We have chosen our own path. 
And therefore, I invite you now to join with me in our unison prayer of confession. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Let us now silently confess our sins to God. Heavenly Father, we've lifted to you the prayers and confession of our hearts and our lips. Lord, it is our desire that we would turn away from a sinful path, from our own path, and turn to you. And it is with a joyous heart that we are refreshed in the good news, that in the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 22, verses 1 through 12. If you'd like to follow along in the Pew Bible, that's on page 21. I'll be reading from the New International Version. Genesis 22, beginning at verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay there, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. He then reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But an angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said, and do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Our next reading is from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 14 through 24. That's on page 1,387 of your pew Bible. James, chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, 
but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, it is, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and not by faith alone. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's once again turn to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are able to gather. Whether in person or online, we know that by the power of your Spirit, near or far, you unite us as your people one people united by your love. Today, we come to you needing your love. We need the refreshment that comes from your love, the forgiveness, the grace, the mercy, the guidance that comes, even when we know we do not deserve it. We need the powerful intervention that you bring into our lives from your love. Lord, this week we have faced hardships. We have faced trials and tribulations. We have faced loss that, that burdened our hearts with grieving. Lord, as we continue in a difficult season, and as we prepare our hearts to come into the Lenten season, we remember that even in our hardship, even in the valley of the shadow of death, that your love still accompanies us. We thank you that Jesus walks with us and leads us through the difficult seasons of life and leads us into new life in him. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would be so moved by your love that we would transform not only our hearts, but indeed our minds and our actions, our entire lives, because of your love. Hearing that call, Lord, from you, we join now with all of the others around the world who pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please join now as we sing together. Sermon hymn number 443, Trust and Obey.
Father, we thank you that you have gathered us to meditate upon your word. We ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to the power of your spirit. Work powerfully in us today that we too may trust and obey. Grant me, O Holy Spirit, your words of life to proclaim this morning. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Here in... Genesis 22, we come to the one, of, one of the most climactic moments in the story of Abraham with the sacrifice that God asks. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain I will show you. Doesn't this seem like a horrific thing for God to ask? I'm sure that it would have been quite shocking for Abraham to receive this request from God. Really not a a request, this command from God. Now we know here because of the first verse that God is testing Abraham. But Abraham is not aware that this is a test. He hears this as a command. One of the things that we've been looking at throughout this story is the fact that Abraham is learning what it's like to walk a life of faith. And Abraham is also learning about God. Now, this is not an easy journey. We know that it's been a journey full of many trials, many tests for Abraham. He starts out on a good note in Genesis 12, doesn't he? God calls him to go into this new land. Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. And when he hears this command from God, what did he do? He went, right? So Abraham went, it says in verse 4, as the Lord had told him. He did this when he was 75, and it was a long time in his journey of faith. And he grew restless. We knew that it wouldn't be easy because from the beginning, we knew his state was one of childlessness, of barrenness. Abraham and his wife, Sarah, had been married for many years, but they had never been able to have children. And so as time passes, the promise that God has made that I will make you into a great nation, promising descendants, promising land, that this is something that it doesn't seem like God is going to fulfill. And as Abraham struck, as, as Abraham struggled, God met him. God reaffirmed his promises. Even as Abraham went and plotted his own course at times, saying, you know what, my servant, he's going to take over and things will pass through him. Or Abraham and Sarah say, why don't we take Hagar and have a child through her? And God says, no, no, that's not what I have planned for you. And even when God comes and says, you will have a child, your own flesh and blood, both Abraham and Sarah in two different accounts both respond to God's promise with laughter because it seems so unbelievable. It wasn't easy just to trust and obey all the time for them, was it? And yet, this is what God called Abraham to, faithful obedience. And now we face seemingly the greatest trial of his life. God has been faithful in keeping this promise, and we don't have an exact idea of how old Isaac is at this point, but he's old enough to know a little bit of what's going on isn't he? Because he's traveling. He's not a, an infant. He's able to talk with his father. I think it's so interesting that Abraham doesn't question God in this account. He just goes. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, loaded his donkey, took enough, and took with him two of his servants and his son, And he cut enough wood for the burnt offering. He set out for the place that God had told him about. 
By the way, just as a quick aside, one of the neat things that we looked at in Bible study is all the parallels you see here between, uh, between this account and the account of Jesus heading to the cross. Just something to keep in your mind if you're hearing things that sound familiar. I think the Bible has a beautiful way of tying things together. So they take this three-day journey, and Abraham gets there. And he tells his servants to wait. And this is where I think we get our first clue. Abraham has learned about God in these years of walking with God. Now, the idea of child sacrifice is nothing new in the ancient world. In fact, many other religions around, many other gods in that area would tell people, sacrifice your firstborn child. This is how you receive favor from God. So the idea of sacrificing a child was not as radical as it seems to us. It's something that people would do, as grotesque as that is. But that was the world that Abraham lived in. But what does Abraham say? God has said, go and sacrifice your child. So what's going on in Abraham's mind here? Well, I think Abraham has learned a lot about God, which allows him to say this, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. What's the picture that you would have here as Abraham? It's not, uh, we're going to go up and worship and I'll come back to you. It's we will go up, go up and worship and we will come back to you. I think this gives us a clue that Abraham is coming to understand something because you and I know that God isn't the type of God who demands child sacrifice. And maybe even in a world where that happened, Abraham dared to have faith that that's who God was. So the story continues, and Abraham takes the wood for the burnt offering, places it on his son Isaac, and he carried the fire and the knife, and they walk up together, and Isaac spoke up and asked his father a question. Father, yes, my son, the fire and wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Now, we know in this story where that lamb is, at least at this time, that lamb is Isaac, isn't it? I mean, that's how we would understand where we are in this story. He is the sacrificial offering. But again, I think Abraham, having some insight into God, answers this. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Now, here you could read a little bit into this either way. Wasn't Isaac the miraculous son that God had already provided? Sure, it could be that, but based on what we also heard earlier, I think that Abraham is hopeful and faithful that God will intervene. And so we know that as Abraham goes and he prepares to sacrifice his son Isaac, God stops him. And the story continues on that Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket was a ram caught by its horn. And he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. God had tested Abraham, and Abraham had passed the test. But God also did something else in this. He provided. He did provide the sacrificial offering. And that sacrificial offering was not Isaac. And thank God for that, right? This, would, this is a pretty scary story. This is a pretty horrific story. And, and if the end of the story was Abraham killing his son Isaac, this would be a horrific story. But that's not the kind of God that God is. We have a God who is a provider. And so after this time of testing, God has provided for Abraham. Or, and, and we see beyond this that the Lord says, the angel of the Lord called out to Abraham from heaven a second time, and it says in verse 16, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and, 
and through your offspring all nations on the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Now I thought that God was already going to do this stuff, right? Didn't God already offer this promise time and time and time and time again? So if God had already promised this, what is the purpose of testing? If Abraham failed this test, would God have said, fine, I'm out, my promises are null and void? I don't think so, because Abraham has been one who struggled with God's testing in the past. James picks up on this theme, talking about faith and works, and it, it can bring us into a bit of a confusing place, because one of the things that we believe that's core in our belief is that, uh, as Protestants, is that we are, are not saved by works, right? We're, we are saved by grace through faith. And we are saved not by our work, but by God's work. So how do we make sense of all this? Abraham becomes a beautiful example of faith for us because his faith is accompanied by action. I think there's the temptation in the modern world for faith to be something that we believe in our head or we believe in our heart but is not believed in our actions, that is not lived out in what we do. And that is the type of thing that James is speaking to. James also speaks to the other side of that, that people who don't have faith but just have good deeds. Look, as Christians, we don't have a monopoly on being good people. There are people who don't go to church, who don't follow God, who reject God, who are good people. But what we're called to is more than being good people. We are called to being people of faith and faithful obedience in God. And I believe that just like Abraham, we too are tested in our faith. Now, don't get me wrong, we are not tempted by God. God does not tempt us to sin. That is not the work of God. James talks about that earlier in the book. We are tested by God. And one of the ways that I was thinking about this, how many of you out there have had any interaction with like martial arts? Have any... Some of the kids I know back there, right? Didn't, I guess, well, you saw your cousin do it. I know that like, Brody did that for a while, right? He, and one of the things that you start out, what color belt do you start with? Start with a white belt. And if you want to go up to the next level, what do you have to do? Does the instructor just look at you and say, hey, you've been doing a good job, here's a new belt, slap that on? No, there's a test, a test that might progress. So you move from white to yellow to you know, green to blue, all, all the way up to black belt. You're tested. And that testing by someone who cares about you, by someone who wants to see you grow, helps you grow. It encourages you. You know, I think most of us think about testing at school, and, and those were maybe dreadful experiences for us that, uh, we, that filled us with anxiety. But when God tests us, it's an opportunity for us to grow in our faith, to develop, to become more than we are now. Don't we see that in the life of Abraham through his journey, that he is so much more than the man that he was when he started? The promises of God can be reaffirmed because this is what God already intended to do. But when we look back at Abraham and, and the language that we have about him, that he was God's friend, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. Friends, isn't that what we want? Don't you want to be called God's friend? Don't you want a kind of life that when you look back 10 years, you say, wow, I can see how I've grown in my faith. I can see how I've grown, not just with a sense in my heart, a sense in my mind, but a whole life that has been transformed by God. That's what we're invited to. And that's what God wants us to have. 
There's a fancy Christian word for that, and that's sanctification. It's the work of being made more and more like Jesus. There's a lot of great images. Think about the fruit of the Spirit. Who brings about the growth of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives? Do we work really hard at that? No, it's God who brings about that work in us. So we trust our God who leads us. Friends, Romans 12 offers us a picture that I think ties in well here. Because we know that the life of a Christian is one of self-sacrifice. Because that's the life of Christ. He went to the cross and we are blessed for it. Romans 12 tells us this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Someone told me the problem with a living sacrifice is that we can crawl off that altar. God wants us to be people who faithfully obey, but it, it, it asks us something that's really hard. Do we believe that God's reality is better than our own? Abraham believed that. I think that's what enabled him to go. Even if he would have brought that knife down into his child, which, thank God, he did not, and did not have to. But that life with God was better than the life that he would have on his own. Because when he tried to take up his own path, when he tried to go his own way, how did things turn out? They were problematic. And isn't that the story for all of humanity? Back in Genesis in the garden, when, when God says, look, I have this abundant garden for you to enjoy. Just be fruitful, multiply, enjoy the food, enjoy each other, right? Adam and Eve probably had a good Valentine's Day. Anyway, you know... The thing is, they could have had that. And what do they say? We want to go our own path. Our hearts are not unlike their heart. This is why Abraham is a great example of faith. Because he shows that it's accompanied by what we do. Friends, may we be people who are ready for God to test us. There are many disciplines, disciplines that I think we all know well. Prayer, scripture reading, fasting, giving, worship. All of these things are things that we can do to prepare us for that time of test. But we have a God who doesn't want to leave us where we're at. We have a God who wants us to grow, wants us to see more of the reality that he has for us, just like God wanted Abraham to see more of the reality that he had for him. So may we be people who follow in faith. May we be people who trust in God's reality for us. And may we be people who, when God calls us, that we see that as an opportunity to grow. Rejoice with that test and celebrate the work that God is doing and will continue to do in our lives. Amen. Friends, I invite you now to join with me as we affirm our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Brothers and sisters, what is it that we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, we have a God who invites us into lives of abundance. Abundance of love, abundance of provision, abundance of care. Let us respond with singing hearts to God. closing hymn number 51, How Great Thou Art.
trusting in God, knowing that the life that God has called us to, the reality that God invites us into, to live by faith into, is far greater than the one that we can see and know on our own. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you.